Okay. <coughs> so let's uh, continue to with what we were doing, and uh, <coughs> so let's start with the brain world and, and uh, the the uh, motivation for this is the one question you can ask is you have a, a thing, extra dimensions you can say well what, what about if uh, some of the fields live in the full extra dimensions and some of the fields are just trapped in a surface within the extra dimension that is a a, pos a logical possibility. Um, I remember when I, 10 years ago, a friend of mine came out to ask me about that, and I said, well, that's interesting, but I have more interesting things to do. And, uh, <laughs> and I did something else. Okay. <laughs> so uh, in particular, I, it sounded to me like, like a desperate uh, thought of someone who didn't have that much to, set, to do. But uh, it so happened that, that uh, uh, that is the genetic case in string theory, and that, that's, that's the reason why I think it's interesting. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, so we have uh, some in extra dimensions. We can have some fields, usually to be the graviton and other fields related to it, like in string theory, the dilaton, and so on, live in, a, in the full space-time, and others are trapped in uh, surfaces, so the brains, for instance, uh, the standard model fields. Okay. And as I told you, the best example of that was, uh, was in string theory to have matter and gauge fields coming from open strings, whereas gravity come from closed strings, can live in any place. So then we can have a P brain here, or it's called a D brain in string theory because this is a, a there is lead boundary for the open strings, and uh, they are trapped on this brain. These fields are trapped on this other brain. This can be the standard model, the observable sector, and this could be a hidden sector. Whereas gravity fills the whole extra dimensions, and this is a bulk. Okay, so that, that is a, a typical situation, and that is very natural in string theory. And there are other, other examples. <coughs> and, <coughs> okay, so, uh, so what is it that, that, that is special about this situation? So let me, let me just t tell you about um, the physical implications. Let's start, for instance, in 5D to, for simplicity. So then you will start with your Lagrangian. It will be the 5D Lagrangian, say for uh, Einstein, Hilbert, and so on. So this will be the bulk part. Well, then you can have a brain part. And the brain, if the brain is a three brain, that means only three special dimensions, this, this part of the Lagrangian will be subject to the whole kaluza klein analysis, but this part of the Lagrangian will not be feeling anything about the extra dimensions. In particular, there will not be any kaluza klein modes here. Remember that the, the mass of the kaluza klein modes were 1 over the radius, and they appear here, but not here. Because this will be only, so S brain can be something like a integral of d for x, root of a g, and then you can have, I don't know, f mu, f mu, and so on. Okay, so this is, uh, the picture we have so for, uh, with this, and, and uh, why is this important? This is important for the issue about scales. And let me tell you. So 
talking about scales. Scales. We know that uh, I should have written here. Which I always forget, but this is important. This is m star cube. This is the, the fundamental scale of your five-dimensional theory. And uh, so you start with the scales. Usually, in, in general, let me write it in general. You will have n Planck square is always equal to to the fundamental scale in the extra-dimensional theory um, to the power d minus 2 times the volume of the d minus 4 extra dimensions. So this will be essentially m star to the d minus 2 times a radius, a typical length for that uh, uh, higher dimensional scale to the power of minus 4. Or we can write this to be um, talk about uh, lengths rather than masses. We can write this as 1 over the Planck length square to be of order 1 over the fundamental scale, L star to the power d minus 2, times the radius to the d minus 4. So again, as I, I, I told you before, this left-hand side, we know what it is, because this is, a, this is the, the Planck length. So this, this is the famous 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. The right-hand side, we don't know what they are. And, and, but we wanted, in the standard calusa klein uh, context, we wanted both R and L star to be smaller than the smallest distance we have ever being able to test, which is 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. Okay. However, now in the brain world scenario, things change. And things change because L star still is restricted to that scale, because that's where the standard model will be. That will be the fundamental scale of your theory. But the radius doesn't have to be that much restricted. And why is that? The reason is because if it, if it is only gravity that fills the other extra dimensions, it is gravity that will be filling this size of the extra dimensions. And gravity has been only tested up to one fraction of a millimeter. So it's only to very big distances, just 0.1 millimeter. So the radius can be as big as a 0.1 millimeter, and still everything could be consistent. So that's, that's, that's the, the big difference between the brain world and, and the standard calusa klein the Standard calusa klein <coughs> radius has to be smaller than 10 to the minus 17. In, uh, in the brain world, the radius can be of order one, uh, 0.1 millimeter, and still we are fine. Okay. Why, why does it have to be a circular dimension? No, it's not a circular. Yes. That, that, uh, that's what I say is the if volume. If we have like two brains, can we have like you know, the dimension between? Can it have like an infinite dimension? An infinite size dimensions. Uh, in general, I will say no, but uh, at the end of my lecture, uh, in 10 minutes, I will tell you yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> but usually it's compactified. So this is the standard thing is a compactified case. So um, let me just write this and then. Um, so, well, at least we know that for a fact LP is 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That L star has to be smaller or equal than 10 to the minus. So it's 17 centimeters to have, that, that's, uh, we have explored all the way to 10 to the minus 16, so 10 to the minus 17 is still okay. And, but R, the only constraint we have on R is that it has to be smaller than 0.1 millimeter. This is in, in, uh, in the brain world. And of course, R 10 to the minus 17 centimeters in Kelsa Klein. So, okay, so that, that, that is the, the difference between the two cases. <coughs> okay, and uh, so, and uh, let me just write this in a, 
So that we can then we can write this equation like a r to the d minus four, which is this is the thing that we want to know. This is fixed that it has to be definitely less than that. But r we can play with, and so we can write this as a uh, what is it? L star to the d minus four times L star or L plan square. So that means that r has to be of order L star times the ratio L star or M plank to the power 2 divided by d minus 4. And uh, so for instance, take d equals to 5. That tells you that r has to be less than this or than or equal to L star, I told you, has to be smaller than 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. And then this ratio is 10 to the minus 17 divided by 10 to the minus 33 to the power uh, 2. Okay. And uh, that tells you that, that uh, Um, you know, 33 minus 17 is uh, 16, and square is 32, minus 17 is 15. So this is a order 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 9 kilometers. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, which is not very good. Okay, so in this sense, five dimensions don't look very good, even for the brain world. They can be, you can have a large extra dimensions, but not 10, 10 to the 10 kilometers. Okay. So that means that uh, you can have if, that means that the fundamental scale doesn't have to be, I'm putting here the, the 10 to the minus 17, the, the, the limit, it can, it can be smaller, and then you can still have a, 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 a large a, a radius, but, not, <coughs> but if we, we, ha, we want to have the fundamental scale to be the TV scale, then the radius will be too big. So five dimensions don't look good. Okay, for d equal to six, you can do the same thing, and then you will get r to be precisely of order one millimeter if L star is 10 to the minus 7, 7, 17 centimeters. So the only thing you do is put here d equals to 6, and then you will get. And this is very exciting, because precisely the, the two limits combined experimental. Experimentally, it will tell you the standard model is test, tested up, up to this scale. And experimentally, gravity is tested all the way to this uh, scale. So this is living in the edge. So six dimensions is the edge. So it's still consistent to have a, a, a brain world scenario in which you will see the extra dimensions coming at, at the distance that you can see with your eyes in principle. <laughs> but of course, it's in the extra dimension. And, uh, but uh, L star, this 10 to the minus 17, remember I got it from the, this is the inverse of a TV. So that means that the fundamental scale can be the standard model scale, and the radius is, uh, is 0.1 millimeter. This is interesting, and people uh, have uh, called this, uh, it's usually called the ADD scenario. For Arkani Hamed, Dimopoulos, and Valley, and, uh, and uh, uh, it is interesting because it has uh, important phenomenological implications. Because uh, you can see it in the next round in LHC, you can see this. this uh, uh, you will be able to test these distances, that these scales, and also uh, tabletop experiments like uh, generalizations of the Cavendish experiments to explore gravity at, sm at smaller distances can test this 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 theory. So this is something that is very getting closer to, to, to real physics, to experiment. And uh, so these people explored, and, and it caused a, a lot of uh, reaction, and this was 1998. Uh, and uh, um, so the way to see, well, one way to see this is that, look at what we are doing. We're taking that the fundamental scale is not the Planck scale, but is the, the fundamental scale in your extra dimensional theory. So that means that the Planck scale is just a derived quantity. As I get it from here. It's just a derived quantity. And this is my fundamental scale. So that means, remember the hierarchy problem, the why the, the Planck scale was so large compared to the, 
TV scale. So we used to say, oh, the Planck scale is fundamental, and then why is it that TV scale is so small? Now the question changes. Now we say, well, the fundamental scale is the TV scale. So the only question is why the M Planck is so large. And the reason will be, oh, because the radius of compactification is large. So then you change the hierarchy problem to another problem. It's, but this problem is more dynamical. It's, if you have a mechanism to fix the radius, if that, if that mechanism fixes your radius to be very large compared to the, your front, you start with the fundamental scale at this level, and then you find a way to fix the radius at this scale, then you're done. That solves the, the, the hierarchy problem, which I think this is very exciting. So this is another um, so hierarchy problem becomes dynamical question. Why R is much bigger than L star? Okay. So this is a competitor to supersymmetry to solve the hierarchy problem in that regard. But of course, it's not a solution, I insist, as long as you don't have a way to fix the, the, the model. So that uh, I would like to emphasize uh, as much as I can that this is a major problem in extra dimensional theories. Find a way to fix the model. I mean, it finds the way of fixing the, extra, the large size of the extra dimensions. And that, of course, this problem moves all, all the way to string theory. That's one of the major problems in string theory. OK. Yes? Why, why must we take TV scale as a fundamental Very good question. Yes, it does not, there's no reason. There's no reason. So this is the extreme case. This is the extreme case that I say, well, how far I can, I can stretch my knowledge? So let's, let's move to the, to the level where that has been tested experimentally. And there is a good reason, because at that scale, we know that something is happening. It's this whole standard model is there. So why, why don't we choose that, this scale to be the, fun, the fundamental scale? And then see what happens. And then everything else is derived. But of course, you, we can move on. Sorry? Yes. So if we don't get it, then we're going to have to push the fundamental scale. Uh, absolutely. Yes. 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 Absolutely. That, that's, that's an issue. And so, for, for instance, if you talk a typical string theorist, essentially nobody will believe that this is a fundamental scale. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So, you, a typical question you ask, what is the scale? What is the size of a string? That's a typical question you ask. And everybody says 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Yes. Because they all think that the radius has to be a further one. Uh, but uh, this is not necessarily the case. In principle, you can have, and actually there are now in the literature mechanisms for which the radius is naturally fixed to be exponentially large. So in particular, can be like uh, as large as this. So, <clears throat> okay. Um, and of course, we can move on for larger uh, dimensions. Then the situation is less in the limit. So this is the extreme case. Six dimensions is the extreme case. But if you go to 10 dimensions, you can still have the fundamental scale to be this. But then the radius can be much, much smaller. So you can start playing with this formula when you don't have nothing else to do. So this is a nice uh, thing to start playing. Oh, let's do it here 10 and see how, how big the radius can be. And you get things like 10 to the minus 12 centimeters and this kind of thing. So it's less dramatic and, uh, and uh, of course, farther away from the experiment. So and that, I would have to say, maybe a more realistic scenario. This would be the, like a, the best possible scenario that this happens, in the sense that something would be seen in the experiment. But of course, as you say, if something is, is not seen, uh, uh, you start testing gravity to two orders of magnitude smaller than this, uh, then, well, we can go to higher dimensions and there's no problem. So, or, you, or you can have a fundamental scale a bit bigger and there's no problem. So there's, this is not a real physical prediction. So there's something to have clear. This is just a, something that, that, that is, uh, um, at least it's not ruled out, and it's, it's very interesting. Furthermore, if you want to speculate, you can see that this scale, if you move it to, to the energy scales, is 10 to the minus 3 electron volts. That when you make that to the power 4, it's precisely the scale of the cosmological constant. So that's very appealing also. OK, so that's the, so that's the problem for, for, for this scenario to be to, to do um, Something more uh, more realistic. It's, it's just I mean to solve the hierarchy problem, you need to fix 
the radius to be very large, and that is not offered by this scenario. Okay, then there is this other scenario I will call this uh, Randall syndrome. And Randall syndrome is a small, when this uh, came up, people started playing with these uh, ideas. And, uh, <coughs> and Randall syndrome is a paper I, I actually recommend you to, to read that uh, is very simple, and that's one of the main reasons of success of this uh, scenario. Uh, and I, I will give you the hip, the hip number. It was even written as a phenology paper. And it's, it's that simple that uh, one of the exercises in the example sheet is precisely about this model. <clears throat> the idea is the following. So idea is start in 5D still and compactify not on a circle as we have been doing, but to another, do you know how many, uh, one dimensional spaces do you know? The real line, the circle, and what else? An interval. <laughs> so it's just from here to here, that's it, without closing it. So, so, so they have starting with 5D on an interval. This uh, interval, this, uh, the definition of the interval, you can do it. Uh, in a sophisticated manner, and that's called, usually called an orbifold. And an orbifold is, is, in this case, is a, I would call it as O, O1, uh, and that is take the circle and mod it out by Z2. What this modding out means, it means that you take the, the Y coordinate, remember that Y equals to y plus 2 pi r defines the circle. So this defines is 1. And then furthermore, you take y and identify that with minus y. And that defines this O1. And it's called an orbifold because it's usually not a manifold because the, the, there are fixed points. And the fixed points are y equal to 0 and y equals to half of the interval. So you start with your whole real line and at the end of the day you, you say, well, if I do this identification, I take this point is special, but also this point here, pi r, it's special because uh, when you send it to, to minus pi r, then it will be identical to this by a shift of, of 2 pi r, which is what defines the, 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 the circle. And then every single, every, all the points here, so you just take the, the circle to be from minus pi r to pi r, you say that this half already is identical to this half by this identification, so at the end, your space is only this part. And uh, so this point is fixed because 0 goes to 0, and this point is also fixed because pi r goes to minus pi r, and then you get back to it by a, sh by a shift. And these are the only two fixed points, so this defines the interval. So the interval is uh, uh, this, from 0 to pi r. Of course, there are more general, uh, higher dimensional realizations of this, and that's the just the defining orifice. And that has been very much in using string theory because all ripples is a way of getting chiral matter when you compactify string theory, unlike the torus. Okay. So, so then Randall syndrome room have this scenario. The separation between here is pi r. This is one, one of the uh, fixed points. And this is the other fixed point, and that's a, and that was in the in the in the extra dimension. So this is the extra dimension, 
But then, uh, uh, since we have five, uh, a total of five dimensions, these surfaces here, the end of, uh, of, of, of the intervals, these are 4D. And of course, we have the bulk. OK? So that, that is a simple realization of this brain world scenario. So you can imagine having the standard model on this brain, on this uh, surface, and not on that one. OK, so then, and then they start with the Lagrangian, with the action, to be, say, m star cube root of minus g, the five dimensional um, Einstein metric minus lambda, which is a cosmological constant in five dimensions. And then you have plus an action for a brain one plus an action for a brain two, which are four dimensional actions. They look for solutions of Einstein's equations with this simple scenario in, in five dimensions, and they find that uh, the, the, the element of uh, distance is equal to a factor here that I call the, the, the famous word factor that I mentioned before, times eta mu nu dx mu dx nu, minus, say, uh, u by square. And the important thing now, you will see that the one factor I had set it to one in the previous discussions. And usually didn't play that much of a role. However, here it played an important role. And the important role was, is that uh, um, you find when you plug into Einstein's equations, you find that W of y goes like e to the minus pi, e to the minus y, essentially, uh, times a constant times y. Where this constant k equals to the square root of uh, minus of uh, lambda over 12, if I remember correctly. Where lambda, remember, is this five-dimensional cosmological constant. So you, you get. Um, a warp factor, which is different from zero. And this warp factor, a different from one, sorry. This warp factor plays an important role because it, it is telling you that even though you have Minkowski in four dimensions at its, each slice, it changes, the, 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 your notion of distances changes uh, uh, as you move in the extra dimension. So that means that. Uh, <coughs> That means that you, you start with this uh, uh, take the origin here, and then the other point here. You start with the distances of this size, and the distances start decreasing with a uh, unit of length start from here to here. You can start, imagine that you have here the M Planck, the Planck scale. Then here, your scales will be suppressed by M Planck e to the minus pi r times k, OK? And if you choose r to be of order 10 or 20, so this can be easily of order m electroweak, m standard model, for r of order of the 20, a number which is not that large. Remember, we wanted here r, r to be very big. So it's 18 orders of magnitude, so compared to the fundamental scale. Here, it's just a factor of 20 could do it. And what is it that you get? You get, well, I can have my fundamental scale here to be the Planck scale. And then, but if I have the standard model here, all the distances, all the sizes or masses that I will measure here will be suppressed by this exponential factor. And it will be much smaller. So here I will see, this, this is usually called the Planck scale. This is called the standard model brain, sorry. Planck brain and the standard model brain. And here, for instance, you can see what is the mass of the Higgs? It's the fundamental scale times e to the minus this work factor. So the mass of the Higgs will be of order 10 to the minus, uh, and you will give you the standard model scale, so 10 to the 1 TV or so. 
in an easier way. So here is a way that you can see, even in five dimensions, you can have a nice way to solve the hierarchy problem again, in a much elegant way, because you have a exponential, sorry? Yes, R k of order 20, yes. So R of order 20 in units of k. k is essentially the, the yes. Yeah. R k of order 20. OK. <clears throat> yes, thank you. So this is, uh, again, solves the hierarchy problem. By, by by just getting this this small scale because of this exponential warping. Notice that this exponential suppression we had seen before in the past. Remember, I saw I used to write the e to the minus one over g square m Planck, and that was the way of doing this uh, like a general condensation thing we discussed after supersymmetry breaking. That uh, because the, the distances uh, run with the, with the scales in a logarithmic way, uh, uh, the, and, and number two, the effect will give me a e to the minus 1 over g squared. Remember I, I mentioned when we, we talked about uh, supersymmetry breaking. So this is a similar case here. And actually, this change with the scale as you move from here to here can actually be seen related to, to a change uh, uh, in a romanization group, which is something very beautiful that, uh, for instance, uses these ideas of ads EFT and so on that you have uh, been learning, that you have been hearing about, hearing about probably not learning yet. OK. so. This is another way of, of, of approaching it. And, and then uh, that, that has a, uh, created a lot of uh, interest, because it's a nice, uh, here you don't need a big, big scales. I personally didn't take it this uh, very seriously, because uh, I said this is very nice. It's a toy model. Just five dimensions. You put this, put gravity with a cosmological constant. What does that have to do, say, with the string theory? I, I didn't say it. Uh, curiously, uh, two years ago, there's a uh, very nice paper of a uh, Polchinski, Giddens, and Cash, they, they found a similar mechanism, but in a, not, not as simple as this, but real, realizing a string theory, where you can get precisely this hierarchy with an exponential work factor. And that's what, uh, considering the fluxes of anti-symmetric tensor fields in, in, uh, in 10 dimensions. So that is something this scenario actually has a realization from a string theory point of view in a much more complicated setup. It's not a, just an interval, but it's just a, a complicated Calabellao manifold with a long throat and so on, but at the end, the effect is the same. Okay, so which is interesting. Yeah. Very. Yes? If we feel it in the other brain, we can, in principle, know something about the other through gravity. Yes, through gravity, yes. That's true, yes. And also, uh, Randa and Sundra have two papers, one after the other one. Then at some point, because of the question you asked before, uh, then the, the way to understand this is, is that is that you can look how the, the 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 graviton wave function looks like, and then you start moving, separating these two brains, and at the end the graviton wave function starts peaking at one of the brains. So you can set the separation to infinity, and then you essentially get graviton trapped in, in this brain, and that's why you can set the extra dimension to infinity. That's not a curious thing. Uh, I haven't seen that realizing a string theory. But in any case, it's an interesting idea, and people have played with both. So this is Randall syndrome. This is what people usually call Randall syndrome one, and the other one is called Randall syndrome two when you set the dimension to infinity. So, anyway, so this shows um, this. I finishes actually this this chapter, uh, and then just let me give you uh, in. A taste of what I wanted to say about the last chapter, because I can see I have not much time left. And uh, in this chapter eight, this is Susie in extra dimensions. I saw already that you were discussing if, if, if many of you were in Michael Green's class today. I saw that uh, much of what I'm going to say here, he already said it. But uh, anyway. So the, I will just uh, describe for you what is our spinners in extra dimensions. And that's the only thing that we have left. Remember, we discussed all the fields of uh, spin less than 2, or helicity less than 2, uh, all the bosonic fields. And the only thing we are left is to discuss uh, spinners. So <clears throat> for that, um,
we start with the standard algebra of the, of the Poincaré group. And, and then look for representations. of the Dirac algebra also in terms of gamma matrices satisfying the standard commutation relations gamma m gamma n equals eta m n <coughs> and there's a tool okay and we know that if these are the gamma matrices algebra, then, then, as as in, as it happened in four dimensions, then the the, the operators sigma m n defined to be as a i over four commutator of gamma m gamma n satisfy the algebra star where star is this. So that's a uh, so uh, so let me let me look for representations of of, uh, of this algebra for take first the case where the total dimension is equal to. 2n, where n is an integer, is an even number of dimensions. So, <clears throat> for this, define the, the this operators a k to be i over 2, gamma 2k minus 1 plus i gamma 2k. With a, with also, what I do, I'm using here that gamma two n, and define it as gamma zero essentially, I gamma zero. So you you go back, and so you have here two n minus one two n, and then two n is is essentially gamma zero. <coughs> so n goes from one to on. Okay, so then. Then from the Dirac algebra, which I can call two stars, then this Dirac algebra implies that these operators, the A, satisfy the standard AI AJ dagger equals delta IJ. And of course, AI AJ equals AI dagger AJ dagger equal to zero. So these are standard creation and annihilation operators. Because they satisfy this this anti-commutation anti relations. But they don't have much to do with creators and Yes, and for Munich way, yes, with this anti-commutator, you change the commutator by anti-commutators. Is what we did, for instance, when we discussed the the algebra and supersymmetry. A A dagger equals one. Okay, so then you can define the, the, your vacuum state as usual. So that it is annihilated by all the A's, as usual. Uh, 
a k I think is zero equal to zero. And then acting on it by eight daggers, you get all the different states. So, <coughs> so we have states. We start with the vacuum. And then you have uh, a k dagger acting on the vacuum. So here we have number of states. Same story, you have one. Then here, k, then you have n. <coughs> then you have a i dagger, a j dagger acting on the vacuum, so that you have n, n, n over 2, and so on. And the last one you get is the product of all the a's, so a n dagger all the way to a 1 dagger acting on the vacuum, and then you have 1. And uh, so then you say, well, how many states you get? You get the sum again of one <laughs> of all the combinatorial numbers, which we all know equals to 2 to the n. And 2 to the n, since n is 2n is d, is, is, is d, so this is equal to 2 to the d over 2. OK, so then we have these states. Uh, generated by, by acting the by the creation operators, and we have uh, a, a dimension of this representation, which is two to the d over two, okay? Which I think is very nice. So this is a, sp a spinner representation. Which dimension? Remember, we're talking only about even dimensions so far. <clears throat> Actually, we write every state in this representation as follows. We can write every state in this representation. S1, S2, Sn, just a, a bunch of, uh, of uh, numbers, Si, and we define that to be, and this is a A1 dagger to the power S1 plus a half, times A2 dagger to the power S2 plus a half, dot, 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 A, n dagger to the power Sn plus a half acting on the vacuum. So this is a way of, of labeling each of those states that I wrote over there. So you can see where S, <coughs> S1, the S, all the Ks are equals to plus or minus one half. So you have Sk to one half, that means that you turn on a one dagger. You turn it, if you have minus a half, you don't turn it on. The same for each of the, of, the, of, the, of the operators, and that gives you every single state in that representation. So this is a way of characterizing. So the good thing that you have, you, you define, you, you get an spinorial representation in terms of n, that means d over 2, numbers that can be plus or minus a half. And the different combinations of plus or minus a half you have, that gives you all the different states in your representation. So that's, that's the standard way that people talk about representations of, of the SON group. In this case, we're doing the, 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 the Lorentz group. And uh, <coughs> notice that we can then define um, the, the, the operators as I told you. One is the operator 2k minus 1, 2k, that I define over here. Over here. If I have two, when the indices are, are, are um, one different, uh, i and i plus 1, or i and i minus 1, uh, so they, they commute with each other, as, as you can see from the algebra. As I told you the other day, if here you have 1, 2, and here you have 3, 4. Uh, all these etas require that at least one of the pairs of indices are equal, so, but they're all different, so th they all commute. So they all commute with each other. All these operators commute with each other. <coughs> um, 
And so you can define then what is called the, the so that means that can be diagonalized simultaneously. So, so that means that, that you can have a lot of eigenvalues uh, related to eigenvalues of these operators. So we can define then the, the spin operator. So define SK to be a side like this, sigma 2k minus 1 to k. And then when you do the calculation, it happens to be AK, AK dagger minus a half, where we are, I'm not summing over the case. I'm just, I have, I have a k, a k, a k dagger by using the definition of the a i's that I wrote over there. I multiply them together and I get this operator. And this is, since depends only on, on the index k, I call it sk. But there's nothing sophisticated here. You just uh, two minutes of algebra by doing this multiplication and just get that. So since they can all be diagonalized simultaneously, that means that they have a common set of eigenvalues. And these eigenvalues will be what we call the spins. By the way, I'm basing this discussion in the appendices of the two books, the volume three of Weinberg, of use, as usual, and um, the volume two of Polchinski's. So you want to go to all the way to Polchinski's book. At the end, there's a nice appendix describing all this. And Weinberg also do the same with a slightly different notation. Okay, so that tells you that we, can, we went all the way till the end of this course. <laughs> okay, so then, SK acting on the state S1 to Sn happens to be just little SK on the same state. Okay, essentially because you have uh, the AK, AK dagger multiplying that uh, string of, of, of operators A1, A dagger. So when the AK, when you don't have connected, when S1 equals to minus a half, you don't have connected the AK dagger, so you have an AK, uh, you connect it by, by, by multiplying this, otherwise it will give you zero because they anti-commute. And from that, you will get precisely the, 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 the value of the, of the corresponding entries for the SK. So that means that these are the eigenvalues of this operator SK, and these are SKs with the noise plus or minus a half, these are spins. And as I told you, there were several spins because you have several operators. <coughs> but the good thing is that the maximum value of this object is always plus or minus a half. It's, it's a half. So you can define that the spin of an object to be the maximum value of that will be one half. OK. So these are the, 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 the spinners, for instance, in, the, in 4D. You will have plus or minus a half, plus or minus a half. Those are your four spinners. So how many possible combinations you have is four, four component. Okay, spinner. Okay, so that, that, that is the, the easy way to see. But the nice thing is that this is the way to generalize it to extra dimensions. And, uh, Now that you, we have that, uh, we can then define how this representation is reducible since we can define this matrix gamma 2k plus 1, and that is equal to i to the k gamma 1 of two gamma, sorry, gamma 2n plus 1. Gamma 1 up to gamma 2n. So it's the product of all the gamma n. So this is an analog of gamma 5 that you have seen. And we can see that gamma 2n plus 1 anti-commute with all the gamma n's. And commutes with all the 
uh, MNs. Okay, so then that means that you have, you can diagonalize it together with the gamma MNs. So, and gamma 2n plus 1 square equals to 1. So the eigenvalues are plus or minus 1. So this is gamma 5. And then that separates the representations. That separates the representations. Oops, sorry. Um, that separates the representations that uh, so gamma two n plus one acting on my spin state equals to plus or minus one. And you get a plus sign when you have an even number of minus a half. And you get the minus sign when you have an odd number of minus a half. OK. So when you, that separates. When you have an even number or an odd number, you have a different uh, representations. And each of them, then that will define uh, this, is, this, this will give, give you a right-handed vial spinner. And this is a left-handed vial, vial spinner. OK, so that's, a, that's the tell us a standard that in even dimensions we can have vial spinners as we know in four dimensions also. So this generalizes everything we know in four dimensions. Now we can do the case of odd dimensionality. And I won't go into detail, because we don't have to go into details. Because in here, it's just, it's just the same case as the 2n. But you have to just add the gamma 2n plus 1 to the, to the Dirac algebra. And, and I still. So you have still a, uh, the, uh, the same number, the same dimension of the representation, but now the gamma 2n plus 1 is part of your, of your gamma matrices. So that means that you don't have an extra gamma 5. And since you don't have extra gamma 5, that means that no chirality. No chirality. So that's, that's, that's the important thing. Um, so, so, so since no extra. <laughs> Gamma five. <laughs> this implies that there's no chirality. This implies no vial fermions. Oh, no, oh, sorry, no vial spinners, of course. Okay. Because the whole issue about this, it was less, this gamma two n plus one. Uh, that's the one that was separating it. But now it's part of your gamma, your gamma algebra, so your gamma n algebra. It's still, the dimension of the representation equals to two to the to the n. So in this case, it's two to the, to the minus one over over two. So you have that means that you start with uh, ten dimensions and you start with eleven dimensions. The representation is the same. Okay. Uh, and uh, then in, any, in other dimensions, oh, sorry, in, in many dimensions, you can also define Majorana spinners. And Majorana spinners uh, is just you have to impose a reality condition. I won't go into that. The only thing I have to tell you is that only for dimensions 2k plus 8, you can have spinners which are both Majorana and Vile. And 2k plus 8 is a nice number because it's satisfied by when k equals, oh, sorry, 8k plus. Huh? Uh, when the, well, 8k plus 2, plus, no, 2k plus 8. Uh, it's satisfied, but for uh, dimension uh, k equals to 1 gives you 10, which is the string theory case. And uh, k equals to what? Minus 3 gives you 2. And that's uh, two dimensions, which is the world sheet of string theory. So both the world sheet of string theory and the space time string theory, you can have Majorana vile spinners. So you have an extra, extra constraint. So the only thing I haven't, I won't be able to cover because now I, I took 
several minutes out of your time, and sorry about that, is what happened with supersymmetry. Because now you have the spinners, now you have the, the high the spinners, then the, the supersymmetry algebra will be the same as, as, as before. Supersymmetry algebra will be an, uh, the same. Uh, sorry. Probably, but you are in a hurry. So, so you can talk about the supersymmetry algebra. And if you give me two more minutes of your time, I will tell you. Just to finish this. Um, so for SUSI, so the algebra, <coughs> You say you have the same thing. Generators will be now M M N P M and Q L will be spinners as we have defined so far. And and then the algebra it will be the same as before. And the only thing you have to consider we we, we don't separate now between dotted and undotted indices, because that was a property only of four dimensions, unfortunately. So we have this indices cover the whole spinorial uh, quantities. And then this will give you some constants times the momentum, as usual, but plus uh, extra terms. In this case, this will be, this will be the, the central charges that we talked about before. So essentially, the story is the same when you go to extra dimensions. And when you go for representations of, of the algebra, essentially I already did everything for you um, in the past. And uh, when you, the only thing you have to know is that uh, you want to have use imposed that you want to have a spin less or equal than two, then uh, that tells you how how is the, what is the dimensionality of this spinner should be. So for spin less or equal than two implies that the dimensionality of the corresponding spinner has to be less or equal than 32. So it's something that you, you, you just go with the, as, uh, with the algebra as with creation or annihilation operators. And this implies that the dimensionality of a space-time is less or equal than 11. So this is the famous origin of 11. It's essentially the same, the same origin that we saw before. Actually, you, the uh, way to see it is that you start with 11. 11 dimensions has is the 2 to the 11 minus 1 over 2 gives you 32. So that's, that's the, the magical number. And so 11 dimensions give you precisely that. And, and that's why 11 dimensions is, is, is the maximum way. Uh, one way to see it is that one dim a spinner in 11 dimension has eight times as many components as a spinner in four dimensions. So you have one supersymmetry in 11 that will tell you n, uh, eight supersymmetries in four. And that's eight supersymmetries was the maximum we had found in four dimensions. And uh, <clears throat> so to finish, just because of, uh, of this 11 dimension being so special, uh, so you have the 11 dimension theory is special is because it's, it's so simple. You just have three, three uh, fields, GMN, AMNP, and Psi M alpha, which is a gravitino. A gravitino, a, a, a metric tensor, and an anti-symmetric tensor. When you count components, you have to go to the, to the little group. The components of, of the metric will be, uh, the little group is, 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 is O9. O9. So you take uh, um, symmetric representations of O9, which will be 9 times 10 divided by 2, minus the trace, and that will give you 44. For this one, we take uh, the symmetric tensor of three indices, so it's 9 divided by 3, that will give you 84. And for this one, it's 9 because of the space-time index, times... Um, um, times, um, in principle, it should be 32, but it is 16 because it's Majorana. So you have 16 
minus 16 because you impose a condition. You take out a spin one half a component of this, so you impose gamma m psi m equal to zero. That's a standard way of taking out. In the same way you take the trace out, you take the spin one half component of that. And this is uh, equal to 128. And voila, you have this plus this is 128. So the same number of, of, uh, of, of uh, framing degrees of freedom as as, as a bosonic degrees of freedom. And from here, you can start doing many things. Um, sorry about your time. <laughs> uh, the last thing you can do, and this is the very, very last thing, so you can do dimensional reduction to 10 dimensions. Then, then Then the metric GMN becomes G mu 11, G mu nu, and G 11, 11. The AMNP becomes an A mu nu rho, A mu nu 11, and uh, A, that's it. Because you cannot have 11, 11 because it's antisymmetric. And then psi m goes to psi mu and psi, which is uh, psi 11. And then you, you look at what is the spectrum of this. This is the, uh, <coughs> uh, you look at what the spectrum of this is, and you have here you have the metric. Here you have a, a field that I call phi, which is a dilaton. Here's an antisymmetric tensor with uh, three indices, an antisymmetric tensor with two indices, and a gravitino and a spinner. And uh, <clears throat> all this together gives you the spectrum of type 2a strings in 10D. Okay, the massless sector of that. So that's a nice way to see that you start from 11, you get the, the, the standard 10-dimensional uh, string theories in, four, in 10 dimensions. You go all the way to four dimensions. It's an exercise that I, you have in the example sheet. You go all the way to four dimensions, you get n equals to eight supergravity in four dimensions. So do the same trick and count degrees of freedom, you get n equals to eight. I'm very sorry for taking all your time, and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>